Thank you for tuning in. My name is Ann Morrow, your co-host of the show. If you're joining us for the first time, these shows focus on cycling in general and bicycle safety in particular. We air live on TVC TV the third Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. on Channel 11. You can view the replays on Channel 23, and at least one replay will air on Channel 11. This show is brought to you in an effort to give a broad perspective of the various types of individuals who cycle our Oregon roads. Some ride for pleasure and recreation, and others ride a bicycle as a form of transportation. No matter what level of, or degree of cycling one may participate in, at Northwest Bicycle S Safety Council, we just simply advocate that all users of the road safely share the road. And now, here's the host of your show, Bruce Buffington. Well, thank you, Ann, for that fine introduction. Uh, tonight is a special uh, show. We're going to have uh, some special guests with us uh, tonight, and I will introduce those uh, gentlemen right now. Uh, to my right, we have Carlo DeLupa, who is president and founder of Portland Velo Bicycle Club. And next to him, uh, Greg Raisman, who's from the Office of Transportation, the city of Portland. Yep. And then Dan Kaufman, who is a movie producer, and he is executive producer of Crank My Chain. And welcome to the show. Thanks, Thank you Bruce. very much. Good to be here. According to the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration, about 540,000 bicyclists visit emergency rooms with injuries every year. Of those, approximately 67,000 have head injuries, 27,000 have serious injuries, enough to be hospitalized. 784 bicyclists died on U.S. roads in 2005, 92% of them in crisis with motor vehicles. In 2007, Oregon has had its share of bicycle-related deaths. Carlo, Tim O'Donnell was one of these victims. <clears throat> yes, Tim certainly was. Tim is a member, was a member of Portland Fellow Cycling Club. Um, he was a fellow cyclist and club member. He was a friend to all of us. And uh, his death certainly has shaken uh, the Portland cycling community and uh, our club in general, uh, along with the, the many deaths that have happened in Portland this year, uh, an unusually high year for uh, cycling-related deaths in, in the Portland area. Without trying a case or anything, can you kind of give us an idea of what transpired? Yes, uh, you know, and this is really the tragic thing is uh, Tim and the four um, fellow cyclists he was riding with were doing everything the right way. And this just goes to show you that you can still do everything right and still have an incident, and in this case, a tragedy on the road. Um, they were riding a single file on Cornelius Shefflin Road. Uh, towards a left-hand turn that, that all of us have made hundreds of times onto Long Road. Um, it was a particularly uh, nasty weather day. Um, the, uh, the skies were gray. Um, there, was, there was rain. Um, they signaled, they all signaled to make a left-hand turn. Uh, Tim was riding second wheel and pulled into the lane to make the turn. Um, unfortunately, the driver that was driving the car was going uh, unusually fast and she was driving a silver car with no lights on and that uh, certainly didn't help against a gray background and she came so fast that the, the other cyclists never heard her coming until it was too late, until they actually saw the collision. Um, Tim was uh, thrown into the air and, uh, and the rest, we all know uh, what the outcome was. Um, again, they were doing everything the right way and, and again, still it wasn't enough on that particular day. Now, many of us have ridden on those same roads, and it's basically fairly safe. Wouldn't you say so, Ann? Yeah, I've, I, even from being from Van Vancouver, I've even ridden down there, and yes. Yeah, I've, I've always felt comfortable there as a cyclist. Oh, absolutely. On that particular stretch of road, you have good visibility in both directions. Um, we, we thought that, you know, looking back on this, that there was a perfect storm that day, literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. You had inclement weather. You had um, a, a car that was hard to see. You had somebody that had clearly crossed over the, the yellow line and was trying to pass a cyclist, although they were already signaling to, to make the turn. A lot of things came together in that one instance. It was very, very tragic. And so we're basically talking about rural roads, which you also have some of those in Portland as well. Sure, and I think any road, um, what, what uh, you know, we can do a lot as communities to work together to make our roads as safe as they can be, but if we don't use them safely, 
um, then it doesn't matter how safe we make our roads themselves. So um, when you hear about drivers that are speeding or passing unsafely, um, uh, or cyclists that are behaving in ways that um, increase their likelihood of having crashes, um, a lot of times it really is that user of the road that becomes the most important factor in whether or not we're able to avoid injury and fatality and, and how we're able to work together to have safe streets. And so have you had any experience out there, Dan, riding on the rural roads? Or? Well, I mostly ride in the urban environment, um, which has its own set of, uh, of issues, as you know. Um, I have ridden out in the rural roads, and, and, and in those cases, I've been surprised to find a lot of leeway given to me, passing room, people slowing down for me, which I appreciate. Um, but I generally, as, as, a, as a cyclist, I, I ride with the assumption that everybody's out to get me. <laughs> and, uh, and that served me well, but again, you can do everything right if somebody is going to disregard uh, the rules so that they can save us themselves a couple minutes, then, you know, I, there's not a lot you can do there. You said something very interesting, and one of the Beaverton police officers on the bike patrol here um, just recently said, well, you know, there's two things to, to do. Uh, be aware and ride paranoid. <laughs> and that's the same kind of, kind of thing that you're suggesting here. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's too bad that we have to do that, and that's not always going to be the solution. Um, but I, I think in general, um, you know, you, you have to make those assumptions that people don't see you, that, um, that for whatever reason, you know. A another thing that I like to do is I always ride or, or try to light myself up or put, I actually use bicycle flags. Um, I feel like I don't want the excuse if I got hit to be that they couldn't see me. You know, and, and I'd add to that too that um, I don't know whether or not I would frame it as ride paranoid. I, I think I would say operate paranoid. Whether you're walking or driving or riding your bicycle, all users of the roads have to be prepared for the unexpected. Um, and so I think that as we have these conversations, really recognizing that um, everybody has some very specific responsibilities, um, but also has some very specific things they can do, no matter how they're choosing to move around, to be able to have impact on these issues. So as a bicyclist, you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, gosh, there's these situations where I need to pretend like I'm invisible so that I know that the motorist isn't gonna do the wrong thing and put me at, at risk. But at the same time as a motorist, gosh, you don't wanna wind up, even if you didn't do anything wrong, um, in a situation where you've hit somebody. And so operating your motor vehicle in a paranoid fashion where you're driving as defensively as you can so that you can avoid those crashes in case another person on the road does something unexpected um, is also really important. I like what you said about <coughs> driving or even riding defensively. I guess in a sense you might be driving your bicycle defensively Correct. is what you're saying. Yep. And you touched on something, Dan, about having flags almost like a see and be seen. Now, I happen to know that you uh, on Crank My Chain I, I checked out a couple of your uh, video movies, online movies, and one of them, you have some uh, tools that you use when you ride. I was especially impressed with this horn that you were. Uh, oh yes, uh, the <laughs> Crank My Chain bicycle horn. It's, uh, <laughs> it operates off a nine volt battery, and I knew this had to be out there, and I found them, um, and they are loud at 105 decibels. Wow. So. Uh, people will hear it with their radio on and their windows uh, rolled up to a degree, you know. Uh, but uh, I really like having that bike horn. I use it all the time. Probably not the best thing for a shared use path, though. No, it's not, but I have, <laughs> I have a trick for that. I, I, I cut my hand over. <laughs> yeah, for those paths, I have my little bell. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, we all have, have ridden it in groups. And, and there's a certain amount of road etiquette when you're riding with groups too to help keep us safe. Can you describe some of those things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is safety in numbers, which is why a lot of us on in s recreational cycling like to go out and cycle together along with the camaraderie and, and just how fun it is to get out there. When you get into larger groups, however, there is definitely etiquette. There are definitely safety considerations that you really have to pay more attention to um, than when you're, and there are different set of circumstances than when you're uh, cycling alone. The first is, of course, is to be able to um, communicate up and down your line 
and uh, be able to, to call out obstacles or if a car is coming to yell car back um, and working together in that regard to make sure that everybody's aware of the dangers that may be coming up or, or coming behind. The second thing is, of course, on very, very busy roads, it's, it's almost imperative, and this is one thing that we always drive home with the club, that we get into single file. Um, I know that sounds a little corny sometimes to <laughs> a lot no of people. That's no fun. How do you get that talking? <laughs> it could be fun when you're into the world. <laughs> That's but, true. Uh, yeah, but single file is very important, especially on some parts of Evergreen, for instance, out on this side. Um, some parts, especially going over the 205 bridge, sometimes I know it sounds kind of funny, but you know you have cyclists coming the other way, and sometimes you don't see them until it's too late. Um, and then really the, the next thing is to be able to um, just be much more aware because now you have somebody behind you and somebody in front of you. The space spacing is a little bit different and um, just your general awareness changes when you are in a group and cycling within a group. Now I know that I've <laughs> had a certain amount of training from Ann with the wheelman and there's an orientation before you go out on these group rides. Yeah, I think a lot of new riders and motorists with their windows up may not realize that we communicate a lot on our bicycles, but we using our voice and using our hands, using signals and things. I think it's really important, like Carla's demonstrated, that you know we have to communicate to one another. And, and in a group ride, you look out for one another, and you yell car back, and you point out the hazards and things. And, and uh, I like to think that when a motorist is coming up and he sees us riding two and three abreast, solving the world's problems on our bicycles, they don't realize we're yelling car back. And we expect the, our fellow bicyclists to get in single file, and we get mad at our fellow cyclists if they don't listen to what we're yelling at them. Absolutely. So when you hear this from, uh, especially from motorists that have had certain experiences with uh, interacting with cyclists on the road, those darn cyclists. Now, they're not talking about cyclists who are out there acting responsibly. Sometimes it's those that, that are kind of ignorant too. Is that, could that be a case? Well, yeah, and I think you do touch on a very, uh, a very important thing and, and not everybody necessarily follows the etiquette of the road. I was dri driving down Burnside in the left-hand lane towards downtown and um, I looked over to my left and there was a bike messenger straddling the, the yellow line. Um, we were going slow, but he was still out there in the yellow line and he was passing me. <laughs> he ended up going in front of me and then back over to the right. And I thought that was just a little bit nuts. I understand that people <laughs> may bike a little differently downtown sometimes, but <laughs> that was a little bit out of the ordinary yeah. even for me. And I think the, the important thing there too is as soon as you start getting a, a big mass of cars and bikes together, the, the potential for incidents automatically rises. I disagree with that. You don't think so? Uh, definitely not. I, when I think of the term safety in numbers, um, I think of it as a group ride like you express, but I also think of it as um, the reality that as we increase the number of people that are riding bicycles, we decrease our crash rates. Um, uh, and we've definitely experienced that in the city of Portland, um, and it really is in it really goes well hand in hand with international research on the subject about um, safety and numbers on that bigger scale. So for example, over the last 10 years in Portland, we've gone from 17 reported crashes per million trips down to 10. So we've reduced our, um, our reported crashes by you know 40%. At the same time, our number of bicycle riders has ballooned from about 2,800 trips a day across our Willamette bridges up to 14,500. We've seen you know, a five-fold increase in ridership while we've seen a 40% reduction in crash rate. Um, so uh, I think that that comes with a lot of, for a lot of reason, people expect bicycles on the road. As I ride my bike, I start driving differently. Um, uh, things like this that really start to drive uh, really positive results in terms of um, increasing safety as you increase people riding bicycles. That's sure been my experience this summer. I, maybe it's just my imagination, but it seems like, o like over the last six months with all that's happened with, with really negative bicycle accidents and things, it's really gotten the motorists are so aware and so nice. I mean, it's almost like, I don't know, these little chipmunks I used to watch in the cartoons, Chip and Dale, you know, no, after you, no, you go first. When you get to a four-way intersection, you're there for like a half hour, no, you go. I, I call it a nice off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's a big change, and I think it's education and all of us being more aware. Yep, and it translates. When we look at other modes, whether it's walking or driving, you know, for example, 10 years ago in the city of Portland, there were 17 bi pedestrian fatalities. Last year, there were six. Um, our number of motor vehicle injuries is, is significantly down. 
Um, so uh, these safe roads, as we really think about roads that are safer for the most vulnerable, they become safer for everybody um, because of how people are using them differently. Well, that's a great point. That's, a, that's exciting because I think so many folks are drivers. I mean, that is a primary means of transportation for so many folks that to hear that these improvements that we're making for cyclists, which is a smaller percentage, might have benefit for them as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, it does. I mean, as the numbers go up, we wind up with situations that we don't expect. So there might be a place, let's say, Interstate and Greeley in our city, where certainly very high right now uh, importance in terms of solving safety problems there. If you were to ask me a year ago, is Interstate and Greeley a problem? I probably wouldn't have thought so. Um, and so as you wind up with higher concentrations, you wind up with certain circumstances that need to be addressed. But when you think mm -hmm. of it as a system, um, it's definitely getting safer. I think that's a good point. And, and I think uh, a lot of us uh, forget that we're both cyclists and we are drivers. And certainly my driving has changed quite a bit yes. uh, in the last two or three years as, uh, as we've seen some of the incidents on the road. I'm very careful, and mostly because I don't want to hit a cyclist with a bike rack on my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really I have shot. one of those Washington yeah. State share the road license plates. <laughs> I really have to behave myself. And I have a Northwest bicycle safety sign <laughs> on my window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm just likely to get interviewed about it the next week. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> <laughs> the other thing I've noticed, too, that we get a lot of calls and questions from people who haven't ridden in a while, or maybe uh, families who uh, had bicycles sitting in the garage forever and decided they wanted to venture out, or they've gone out and gotten their first bicycles. Now, these are really inexperienced uh, riders. What do we do about them? Well, I think that um, as we move forward, we really need to be thinking about how to create a real transportation system that serves bicycles. And when I think of a transportation system that serves bicycles, I'm really thinking about uh, roads where a ch it's, it's totally normal and comfortable and non-threatening for, for a 10 year old to be able to ride their bike to their friend's house, or for my grandma to be able to go for a bike ride um, or a walk in a pleasant way and be able to stay active, um, or someone who wants to use a hand cycle that might not have full use of their limbs to be able to do that comfortably and safely. So um, as we think about those types of systems and facilities that really allow a very wide spectrum of users. It's about making our roads feel very comfortable and very safe as a human being, as a person, being on the road in a place that's non-threatening. So we're gonna, so we really think about things like bicycle boulevards, which are um, low traffic streets that are um, specifically uh, targeted for um, uh, reducing the speed of cars, reducing the number of cars, and increasing the amount of information to bicyclists, which routes to go, um, and in doing so, making a much more comfortable environment for lots of things. And we are going to cover that extensively in one of our uh, com uh, segments coming oh, up great. after after Ann's corner. Um, one uh, thing that I, one observation I had is that when you're on the sidewalk, the people on the sidewalk think you ought to be on the street, and when you're in the street, they think you ought to be on the sidewalk. <laughs> what? How do we remedy that? Well, um, gosh, that's a hard nut to crack. Um, I think that um, in general, it's important for cyclists to be on the road. When you're on the sidewalk, you actually increase your chance of having a crash um, because drivers are expecting people to be moving at pedestrian speed on the sidewalk. And so it can really create some conflict situations and increase your chance of crash on the sidewalk, especially if you're going against the flow of traffic. So um, we, we definitely work with people to ride with traffic on the road with the same direction of traffic. The only time when that's different really is with small children um, where you know if a child's going to be riding a bicycle the best uh, place would be supervised by an adult on a sidewalk um, uh, and, and not on the roadway just because of where they are in life. Or if you're going to be going at a very slow rate of speed I would you know if you're going to be riding at a rate that's similar to walking um, which I do on occasion when I'm on the disco trike for example you know, go nice and slow. <laughs> yeah, I'd just say anytime you're on a sidewalk, it's, it's really important to pay attention to driveways and intersections. Each one of these has what we call conflict points. So where at a driveway where a motorist is turning in or coming out of the driveway, it's really important to be very aware of your environment. Same with at an intersection where people are turning with a little bit more speed. Um, uh, uh, I, I just can't encourage people to ride defensively enough when you're riding on a sidewalk. I just got the signal that we are out of time for that particular segment. 
And we need to move on to a very special part of our show, which is Ann's Corner. Well, I wanted to start by saying, um, Lance Armstrong, I think, said, if, if you're afraid of falling off the bike, you'll never get on the bike. So I hope that our conversations this evening about bicycle safety and some of the accidents that we've seen this summer don't frighten people from riding their bikes. We really want to encourage people to ride their bikes. By the same token, if you've got a strong opinion about what's going on here in our community, you reach out to you know your politicians, city, state, uh, county, whatever, whoever can uh, be a voice for you, and reach out to the Bicycle Transportation Alli Alliance, that's BTA, and send them money, uh, voice your opinions, because they're really advocates for, for safety. And certainly everyone wants to hear our opinions and so that we can all have a voice in all of these, these problems. Um, uh, if, if, we, if you're wanting to ride your bike, and like we just talked about, if you're uncomfortable in riding, um, try some of the trails. There's a good bi uh, bike book available at the bike stores. It's called Recreational Rides Around Portland. And it's got many, many bike trails. And that way you don't need to ride in the city streets if you're a newer ad ad adult bicycle rider or if you're riding with children. That's a way for you to be able to ride your bike and not deal with traffic right away. On the other hand, if you're wanting to ride in traffic and you just feel uncomfortable about it, you don't feel secure, try one of the bike clubs, Portland Velo, Portland Wheelman, the Vancouver Bicycle Club, um, all have rides that, like Carla was saying, while it's not a given that there's safety in numbers, there tends to be more of, more of safety in numbers. And you can learn by experience and by observing other experienced bicycle riders how to, how to ride in traffic, how to merge in traffic, how to use your voice, how to use your arms for signaling what your intentions are. And you'll gain confidence and then you'll be able to venture out on your own. And so talking about cycling, I always like to talk about what bike rides are coming up. Um, on New Year's Day, in the Portland area, there's a bike ride in which many different groups, uh, the bike clubs and the bike, sh some of the bike shops, all have their own rides and they converge on the waterfront in the city of Portland. And then they all do a big ride up to Laurelhurst Park. And so as we're going into the holiday season at this point, and you're thinking about 2008, and by golly, I'm gonna really ride my bike next year, that's a great way to start the New Year's, do that New Year's Day ride if you haven't had quite the celebration the night before. <laughs> <laughs> um, after that, the F Cascade Bicycle Club puts on Chili Hilly. Now that's way up in Seattle, it's around Bainbridge Island, but Cascade Bicycle Club calls this the kickoff to the year's bicycling season. So that's the last weekend in February. And again, it's, it's a bit of a long drive for 32 miles. And it's always chilly and it's always hilly, but it's a great ride and it really does get you in the spirit that you know we're starting into the end of winter, we're going to really get into this bicycling season. And the city of Portland, being such a great bicycling city, does not have a bike show anymore. So if you want to go to a bike show in 2008, you're going to have to go up to Seattle. And that's the weekend of March 8th and 9th. And if you go to the Cascade Bike Club site, you'll get the, the details there. And again, if you incorporate some other activities into that weekend, it's fun to go up there and see the vendors, the bikes, the clothes all the rides that are coming up for 2008, and it's just a lot of fun and a good way to get enthused about cycling. So I, I just want to encourage you to ride your bike, and I think that's it for my corner tonight. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Ann. Um, in light of two recent right hook bicycle crashes resulting in fatalities, Commissioner Sam Adams and the Portland Office of Transportation have recommended a pilot treatment at 14 targeted intersections to create safer conditions for bicycling. Greg, what are these treatments and how effective do you believe they'll be? Well, we're looking at a package of treatments. Um, the, the one that's been garnering the most attention is what's called a bicycle box. And a, a bicycle box is a um, treatment that you do um, where the uh, bike lane that's approaching the intersection, as it gets to the intersection, there's actually a large area in front of the motor vehicles that will be um, colored, will have a large bicycle symbol in it. Um, and uh, what it will do will allow um, uh, bicyclists to be able to pull up 
and then over in front of the uh, motor vehicles um, to make them a lot more visible and to take them out of any conflict zone when there's right turning movements. Um, with those, it does mean that there will be no right turn on reds. Um, it also, when the light is green, will certainly increase the amount of visibility that um, uh, people have and awareness that people have that they're in a place where um, there are a lot of bicycles and a place where we've identified as being a rather high risk location for bicycle and motor vehicle conflict. Um, so we hope that they um, also increase predictability, that they really help bicyclists understand what part of the road they should be operating on and also help motor vehicle operators understand better where to expect a bicyclist to be. Um, in addition to bicycle boxes, we'll be using more um, colored bicycle lanes um, where we'll actually uh, fill those bicycle lanes in. Right now you see them as blue um, uh, on the street um, and we'll be doing more of that uh, color treatment in bicycle lanes. In addition, we're looking at activated signs where, um, for example, on Interstate and Greeley is a place that might be a candidate for this where there's an actual detector in the pavement where the bike lane goes and as the bicyclist comes down the hill, they'll trip that detector which will then turn a sign which will rest uh, blank and black, uh, turn it on and it'll say watch for bikes or yield to bikes and have a flashing beacon on top of it. And then the other area that we're really looking at is signalization and um, I don't think this round you're going to see a lot of activity related to bicycle specific signals, um, but we have used a couple of different types of bicycle and uh, one bicycle specific signal and then a signal called a hawk signal that's bicycle and pedestrian specific um, and I do think that you'll see more of that in our safety efforts going forward. Now that's in the city of Portland you have an infrastructure that's somewhat different than in Washington County for example so uh, are some of those programs that you develop do they kind of spill over out here at some point? Um, you know, it, it is one of those parts of um, working in the Portland Office of Transportation where you wind up talking to a lot of different communities um, about different ideas. I think that um, every solution is location specific. There's going to be places where bike boxes work and they don't work. There's going to be places where colored uh, uh, bike lanes do and don't. So um, I, I would be surprised um, if this experiment works if it's not adopted by other places, including Washington County. So how do you get the word out to uh, the motorists? I understand we have a call waiting and it's from, from a motorist, but how do you get the word out to motorists and bicyclists on these bike boxes uh, in a way that is not confusing? Well, um, a, a number of things. The, the first is that we, do, we are looking at how to do um, on-site education when uh, these get installed at first. So whether it's a banner or a billboard next to it or whatever it is, or will be some version of, of education will happen on site immediately. Um, also, the tools that we use to actually implement these are tools that we use all over our system. So for example, a stop bar is a line on the pavement that indicates where to stop. We have advanced stop bars in, in various places throughout the city, and we're gonna use advanced stop bars here. In addition, you'll see a sign that says no turn on red. It's the same sign you'll see anywhere else. You'll see a sign that says stop here on red. It's the same sign you'll see anywhere else. So a lot of the things that are actually sort of the traffic um, uh, control parts of the design are exactly the same types of tools we're using elsewhere. We're just using it in a different application and for different purposes. I understand we have a caller on the line. And uh, is this Brad Elliott? <coughs> yes. Oh, Brad. Brad. Yes, and you had some concerns as a motorist about uh, the responsibility that the motorist has to take on uh, regarding bike lanes and bike boxes, I understand? Yes, I do. I mean, uh, I think we have 100 years of driving in place uh, in this country, you know, from coast to coast about uh, being not, if you're going to make a right-hand turn, a motorist, you have a lot of blind spots, and depending on the weather, I mean, especially at night, whether it's raining, uh, you do not have the visibility that you do looking forward or immediately to your right or left or on your left over your left hand shoulder. So I think the current rule is really a death sentence to bicyclists until that until they put some kind of rule in place that would require the bike to yield before they continue across that intersection. I have been trying very uh, to to drive correctly, just looking over my right hand shoulder and so forth, and it's really taken away from my vision that I should be looking forward and left and right for, for pedestrians and cars. Uh, so I think the current rule 
if it's going to be enforced the way this uh, engineer is talking about, it's just a sim sim simply a death sentence for more bicycles. Uh, Greg seems to have uh, offer some suggestions. Yeah, let, let me react to that. The, the first thing to know um, is right hook crashes are common types of crashes. However, they tend to be amongst our lowest severity type of crash. So, for example, when we look at right hook crashes, 10% um, involve a serious injury. When we look at our number two and three crash type, which is either a bicyclist or a motor vehicle running a stop sign and having a crash with a bicycle, a full third uh, have a serious injury. And that's um, more typical severity level of other types of crashes. So right hook crashes actually are relatively low severity. Um, in our city, to give you another example, in the last 10 years we've had two uh, right hook fatalities and then we had two in two weeks. Um, the big difference there had to do with the vehicles involved. Now, when you think about these types of questions, a lot of times what you're thinking about is accepting a reality that when you have thousands and tens of thousands of vehicles operating through a space at any given point, um, that there's gonna be times when collisions occur. And what you wanna do is to try to make it so that you reduce the severity of those collisions, to reduce the number of people that are getting hurt or dying. And so we're real concerned if you were to start to say that, gosh, um, we're gonna move the conflict point from at the intersection to back, or we're gonna create a conflict zone where a motorist can enter a bicycle lane at any given point. Um, you know, it's a lot easier for us to be able to manage our system to uh, affect a single conflict point rather than thinking about an entire unpredictable zone. Um, in, a, in addition, um, what a lot of times could happen is in particularly congested places where you might have motorists queued to turn right at a signal, let's say, um, uh, and blocking the bike lane, uh, the bicyclist has a legal right to leave the bicycle lane when um, there's hazards in it. And so when that bicycle, when bicyclists choose to do that, um, there's other types of crashes that we're concerned about that can be much higher severity. The other thing I'd say is, um, gosh, if you're having trouble seeing forward um, when you're operating your vehicle because of weather or because of um, steam on the windows or whatever it is, um, please consider um, putting yourself in a position where you can see better. Um, uh, and also, you really should. It, it's, uh, I'm glad that you're checking over your right shoulder, and I hope that as you get used to doing that, it becomes a more natural part of your driving patterns and habits um, because it's really a basic part of safe driving. I know, Dan, you had something that you wanted to add to well, that. Well, two things. You know, one, I just got back from Southern California, um, which, as you know, is, is car central. Um, and I don't necessarily think we want to go in that direction, for one thing. But also, I would, um, I, I saw numbers of cars that would then go into the bicycle lane um, and take it over. Um, which is allowed in California. And I, I do not believe that, that that's a good solution. I didn't see very many bicycles on the roads down there. And, on the, and what you could see happening is somebody, again, you're queuing up for a right hand, then bicycles are then gonna interface in very fast paced roads that are you know, on going into the right lane. So that's one concern that I saw for the alternative, is what, which our caller is advocating. The other thing to keep in mind too is, or to look at it, is if that bike lane is like a railroad train uh, a cr track going down the right hand, you would not turn into a train. And then there are places where there's non, you know, there's places where the signals don't come down. You would not turn your car into that train. You need to look at it the same way as a motorist. And Carlo, did you have any uh, experiences you want to share with Brad? Sure. I, you know, I the a couple of points that I that made me think of, of this. Um, I am so for anything that has to do with increasing visibility at intersections on the road and making things safe for for cyclists and helping to raise awareness of cyclist presence on the roads. Absolutely. Um, but I do want to make it uh, make a point that it is a shared responsibility as. A, couple of us have already said. Um, those of us who bike frequently across uh, certain intersections or certain places, after a while you start to understand or you get to know where the danger spots are. And as cyclists, we can choose to continue our pattern. We can choose to alter our pattern if needed. And I think that's something that we really have to sort of take our responsibility for, and that is to pay, pay attention to what we're doing because we can only control so much. Portland, city of Portland can only do so much for us. The rest is up to us. 
And uh, and what's your experience? And uh, I, I know daily I have this right hook issue. And so what's your experience riding in Vancouver, for example? I, you know, I haven't had a lot of <laughs> problems with it, with any of that. I really haven't. And but by the same token, I ride on the back of a tandem, so maybe I'm <laughs> I'm getting a different perspective <laughs> altogether. Yeah. So since you're riding, I'm reading a book and eating bonbons. <laughs> I traffic, what traffic? All the hazards <laughs> in the front. <laughs> but my my husband, who's you know the captain, is a very defensive a defensive cyclist and really looks out for us. So. Did you have other concerns, Brad? I think the main thing that I didn't hear addressed in the responses was really the fact that there's a blind spot for the driver on the right-hand side, a blind spot. And you can put all the rules in the book that you want, and you can have all the education you want, but still the fact, the physical fact it, it remains that there's a blind spot or two, and also you have bad weather conditions, and not just me, but anybody's going to experience when you're driving. And what you're asking the motorist to do is to be, to, you know, somehow overcome blind spots, which I don't, have not been explained, and somehow overcome bad weather conditions, which has not been explained. You want the bicycle to have perfect right of way, and the motors to be responsible for blind spots, which they can't be, and be responsible for bad weather conditions, which they can't be. You're really asking motors to do all the work. And I, I would just disagree with that. I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, consistently what you've heard from us on this panel, and what you'll hear from the conversation in our city as well, is that it's a shared responsibility. I'm certainly, you know, um, you know, the way that I put it is that motorists should be prepared to yield right away in a, in a, to a bicycle lane, um, uh, to a bicyclist in a bicycle lane, and the bicyclist, like any user of the road, should be prepared for the unexpected. I understand that um, you're gonna be a human being and a person that's operating a vehicle just as I am when I'm driving or when I'm riding my bicycle, and there's gonna be times when you make human error um, however, a lot of these moves are happening um, after overtaking of the bicycle. Um, uh, they're also happening in, in places where you're going to see a lot of um, movement of people on bicycles and walking, and it's places where you really do want to be hyper aware. So I certainly don't put 100% of the onus on the motor vehicle operator. At the same time, I recognize that the law is clear and that I do believe that um, one of the reasons that we're experiencing as a city and as a state much better performance in terms of reducing the number of people that are dying and getting hurt on our streets has to do with um, how we're choosing uh, to operate um, our vehicles and using our facilities and our laws to encourage much safer practices from everybody. I like the way you uh, mentioned the fact that you are a motorist and I would be curious to know how, how many of us drove here tonight? Uh, yeah, so, you're, so we're not just bicycles. No. But I, 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 want, I have a question, though, uh, for the caller. Is I'm concerned about these blind spots. Um, you know, I've, I've driven commercially, and um, I've driven since I was 15. Um, one thing that I've always avoided was having blind spots. To me, if I'm driving in the left lane of the highway and I crash into a car that's in the right lane, because he was in my blind spot. Now, it's n he's not being smart by driving in my blind spot, but if I crash into him, it's still my fault as the motorist, isn't it? There should be no blind spot. If you have a blind spot, you need a better mirror. Well, I have some experience. I was a driving instructor for many years, and I would tell you that <laughs> they teach that there are six blind spots, but really with the SUVs, there are eight. And what I like to do in the clinics is point those blind spots out on the vehicle and actually have a person walk around the vehicle and have someone sit inside. And you can actually see where people just disappear. In fact, one of our crew members mentioned that she was driving and she said, yeah, the cyclist came from nowhere. But not realizing that was a blind spot that they came out of. A good rule of thumb, I believe in my experience is, if you are riding on the right-hand side of a vehicle, if you can see the driver, if you can see his face in that side mirror, and if he's looking, chances are he can see you. He should be able to see you if he's looking in there. And if you, vice versa, if you're on the driver's side and you see the driver's face in that mirror, he should be able to see you. That's whether you're riding your bicycle or driving. Now, there are blind spots in addition to those where they're not gonna see you in mirrors. They have to turn, and sometimes even turning you may not see that cyclist. And I like what Greg says. See, it's, it, we're all responsible for our own safety, and it's all the users of the road basically looking out for one another. 
But yeah, there are blind spots there, and, and I can show them to you anytime you want to see them. Oh, well, they're static blind spots, but I, I, and again, writing in somebody's blind spot is a dangerous thing to do, but I, you know, I do believe it is your responsibility as a, as, as any kind of vehicle Absolutely. operator. Mm -hmm. Just because you're, Absolutely. and that's the other thing is, it's just because there's a blind spot there does not then give you leeway to do whatever the heck you want. That is not an excuse for crashing into somebody. And we hear you know? time and time again, make sure that motorist sees you, make eye contact. I make noise. In fact, yeah. I'll even ring my bell. And sometimes they will ignore you, but that's going to happen. But you have to do something to make sure that that motorist is aware that you're there. That's a pretty big vehicle, a car. And then take a truck. And I don't take any chances with trucks. I want to make sure I've had some kind of communication with that truck. And if I don't, he gets to go first, period. Yep. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, like I was saying, I mean, the difference in the crashes we've had this year that were really high visibility with these right hook crashes, both did involve large trucks. Um, and large trucks are just, uh, uh, really need some special care, um, both from other users, from the operators of those trucks, um, uh, and then also, um, really, there's some um, things about equipment on the trucks, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, for example, um, there's a mirror that can be placed high up on the door that lets you um, see next to it, or, or guards that let you make it so people can't go under the truck. Okay, well that uh, kind of ends uh, this uh, segment. We're going to have to move on to another topic. But Brad, I'd like to thank you for calling in. I think that your, your questions and your issues are, are very valid. Yes. And we do appreciate your input. Again, thanks for doing this work because it is a very important problem that we all have to figure out that you know a good solution for. Well, thank you for the call. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, thanks, thank Brad. And Dan, uh, Dan, <laughs> and <laughs> here I'm rhymes with rhymes with Dan <laughs> and Dan. <laughs> you recently produced a movie for the Bicycle Transportation Alliance with the cooperation of Commissioner Sam Adams. Greg Brazeman and Bruce Buffington. So after we show the trailer, can you explain to the viewers how the concept of the movie came about? Certainly. Okay, so hopefully they have that queued up for us right now. And... Do you feel that your neighborhood streets aren't safe for you and your children? That it's impossible to juggle work, errands, family, and exercise? There is a way out of this trap. It's by tapping into B2 power. It's all about making your streets lovable. And the secret starts with this ingenious contraption. That's the secret behind B2 Power. For B2 stands for Bicycle Boulevards. Bicycle Boulevards are an innovative approach to developing a safe and efficient roadways targeted to all types of non-motorized commuters. A Bicycle Boulevard is a shared street that has been optimized for bicycle traffic. I'm a big supporter of bike boulevards. Bike boulevards are safe. Bike boulevards are cost effective. They help alleviate traffic congestion and neighbors love them because it keeps their streets quiet. The bicycle is the most efficient means of transportation we know of. For most trips, a bicycle can get you to your destination almost or even faster than a car and at much less expense. Since they turned our street into a bike boulevard, our neighborhood is just a nicer place to live. In accessibility, I love being able to go to the hardware store, the coffee shop, and the library in no time flat. So Dan, tell us about this. How did this come to be? Well, there is a group called the uh, Bicycle Boulevard Cabinet. Actually, Greg is on that in that group. Uh, includes Portland Department of Transportation, Bicycle uh, Transportation Alliance, uh, Vancouver Transportation Community Cycling Center, so a bunch of different groups. Um, and they wanted to create a toolkit for other communities to start uh, being able to do bicycle boulevards. 
Um, and that was one of the things that, uh, on, on one hand, and on the other hand, there are more bicycle boulevards coming to the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. But before any changes are made to any streets or neighborhoods, the community needs to be involved and know about what's going on. Um, and it was felt that uh, rather than having a printed document, uh, creating a video uh, might be a better way to get these points across uh, on a first pass kind of a level. There's a lot of detail into how to build this, but this is just to kind of give folks uh, a general idea of what a bicycle boulevard is and the fact that it's not just for bicycle uh, bicyclists, but actually it's a neighborhood safety enhancement that improves uh, overall safety and overall livability in a neighborhood and something actually a, a lot of folks really desire. So well, it looks like you and uh, Greg collaborated on this? Is that yeah, the deal? Uh, <laughs> Greg uh, helped me and well, along with a number of folks brainstorm the idea. Um, I came up with a script, we passed it back and forth, uh, you know, help Greg help with um, graphics and statistics and that kind of thing. And then obviously, <laughs> uh, Bruce <laughs> Robert Buffington uh, <laughs> helped uh, quite a bit with uh, t taking care of what I call the heavy lifting of the video, which was explaining what a bicycle boulevard it is and how they're built and what kind of design work goes into them. And I really appreciate your work there. Well, thank you for asking. And I I've seen a lot of you that. lately, actually, <laughs> in the editing room. <laughs> I thought I was going to end up on the cutting room floor, actually. <laughs> Where's the yellow coat, though? <laughs> well, I don't want to take uh, Ann's segment away. <laughs> well, we got to see the teaser, so where do we get to see the, how will we get to see the whole thing? Well, we are going to be doing a uh, uh, a sneak preview on the third, a party for all the folks who were involved. Um, so um, I'll get you invited to all to that. Um, and then it'll be out, you can see it on my website at crankmychain.com. Um, you can see it at neighborhood meetings. Um, BTA folks might be bringing it by um, or uh, other uh, transportation festivals or, or uh, conferences, that type of location where you'd see it. But yeah, if you want to see it after December 3rd, crank my chain. Dot com. Again, that's www.crankmychain.com, and that is uh, my TV show about cycling. Looks great. Well, Greg, what role did you, you helped him with the script and that sort of thing. So what else are you going to do to help people know about these bike boulevards and how to use them? Well, um, we are actively engaged with bicycle boulevards. We, um, right now in Portland, there's 30 miles of bicycle boulevards, and that's our entire network is 270 miles, and 30 of it is bicycle boulevards. Um, Sam Adams has a proposal for safe, sound, and green streets that will fund um, uh, some major transportation improvements, including another 115 miles of bicycle boulevards. So it'll take us from having 30 miles to 145 miles and really give us a network in the city of bicycle boulevards. The bicycle boulevards themselves really are designed to help inform people how to use them just by being there. So mm -hmm. there's actual pavement markings on the ground that show people when they're on a bicycle boulevard, and then there's arrows that actually point them in the right direction as there are turns. In addition, there are um, guidance signs that'll give three destinations and how far it is and how long it takes to bike there. So in addition, we just do a lot of outreach through um, our, trans our, our uh, tr Smart Trips program, which is really geared towards new riders, uh -huh. um, individualized marketing, talking to people one-on-one -on -one about route selection, doing individual route planning for people. So there's really a whole myriad of things that are happening both within the city and in the nonprofits um, and just grassroots level of getting people out there riding and especially on bike boulevards. We're going to have to uh, go on to our next topic because I just got our 10-minute <laughs> warning and boy <laughs> does time fly when you're having fun. Um, anyway, uh, uh, bicycle safety training programs are based on the premise that behavior by cyclists contributes to the risk of crashes and injuries, and that this behavior can be changed through training programs. Several studies have shown that most crashes were primarily due to some form of human error, and very few were due to the environment or uh, environmental conditions. So Greg, how would you respond to such studies? I think they're absolutely right on. Um, you won't hear the word accident come out of my mouth unless it's an accident. Um, I, I use the word crash um, and collision because these events are predictable and preventable. They have everything to do with how we're choosing to use our roads. Um, uh, an accident is, if you recall last year, there's a tragedy where a rock threw through, flew through a window and, and uh, tragically killed a woman. That's an accident. 
Um, an accident is not when I'm speeding, I'm operating under the influence, I'm blowing through a stop sign. These are not accidents. These are choices that, are, that increase or decrease our likelihood of having crashes. And the um, uh, consequences are as intense as you can imagine. Um, in our country, we're killing about 42,000 people a year in traffic crashes. If we had been following the trends in about 20 other countries in the world, we would be killing about 20,000 fewer people a year. Um, and this has everything to do with both how we're managing our streets and, more importantly, how we're choosing to use our streets. So, um, uh, you know, when we look at crashes, it's about 50-50 in terms of who's in error. Is it the bicyclist in error? Is it the motor vehicle in error? By motor vehicle operator in error? It comes down to the fact that we don't change the character of who we are based on how we choose to move around. You know, we are people that are moving around. We all hold the opportunity to make it so it's less likely that these tragedies happen. You mentioned the SMART program, and I became familiar with that part through the senior adult training program that they have. And I think that's very valuable, uh, it's a very valuable tool. And I know there are other clinics that are going on around the state as well uh, with the sporting goods stores, they're offering clinics. And for new riders that really want to get some information, and bicycle clubs is a good way to grow. I, I grew up through a bicycle club. When I first started riding, I didn't know squat, didn't know the laws, didn't have a helmet, crashed, and <laughs> took eight weeks to heal. Well, from that, I thought, hmm, I better get a helmet. Now I better find out how to ride out here. And so, and, and you find these things out. And so we could connect to these things. And so, Carlo, how would we connect with... Uh, Velo, for example. Well, as of January 1st, we're actually putting together a formal rider education program, and we have somebody named uh, to lead that and to put together um, bicycle safety, skills clinics, workshops, first aid and CPR um, for cycling specific incidents on the road. So that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to focus on. Our, our club's grown a lot, and we've, we get a lot of riders on Saturdays now to the point where the groups are really big. So we want to make sure that new riders can plug into those, those programs, not maybe not r right away go into the big, fast groups, but have a place where they can safely and um, you know, have fun and learn cycling skills and group cycling skills. So that's one yeah. outlet for, it for us. And then wheelmen have a helmet uh, program, and among other mm -hmm. things, Anne. Yeah, a lot of, some of it's in the summer. I think newer riders don't ride so much in the winter. But yeah, sure. um, we have the welcome rides that are geared for newer riders, but you do need to be able to go like 13 to 15 miles an hour. And, and then we have the family rides that are primarily aimed for adults bringing out their children, but really it's for some of us baby boomers that haven't been on a bike for 20 or 30 years and we kind of want to get back into it. So, and, and as I referenced earlier, getting out on some of those trails, staying away from traffic at first, and just uh, seeing how it goes, seeing about wearing the helmet and the courtesies of riding in a group and that kind of thing. So there's, there's lots of things out there. Some of the bike shops too have things for us. I just got our five minute warning, which means that we uh, have about two minutes left for us to talk before we wrap things up. Um, any final comments from you, uh, Carlo? Yeah, you know, uh, although we have seen a lot of incidents on the road this year, I do want to stress that, as Ann had mentioned earlier, um, 98 to 99 percent of the time, uh, motorists are yielding to me when I'm on the road. Um, I, it's it's a true. very very uh, good point. Exactly, um, it's it's rare that I ever see or have an incident with a with another motorist. And what about uh, parting comments from you, Greg? Well, first, thanks for having me. This has really been a great opportunity. Um, and yeah, I really I uh, think this conversation we're having is really important about um, saying, okay, what can we learn from these really tragic events to make it so that we're less likely to have them in the future? And I, I really have a lot of hope that the, these types of conversations, really where you have a caller coming in with concern for safety, the whole conversation is about that. It's about how do we make it better? How do we treat each other better? How do we make our cities more livable? And what can be more hopeful than that? And Dan? Well, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the risks um, associated with cycling and being a road user. I think it's also important that we can that we realize that the bigger risk is not being active, and cycling provides a great way to take care of transportation for ourselves, to get the exercise, and reduce our footprint when it comes to pollution and greenhouse gases. 
I'd like to hear just a little bit about the uh, Copenhagen movie that you did. I was quite impressed with that. I enjoyed that, and I like the. W I know they limit cars to, as to where they can go and so forth. But what was your impression of Copenhagen? Well, it was uh, my friend Johnny Stardust who actually did that video, who visited Copenhagen, and um, you know. It really shows how bicycling is, is a real main form of transportation. Um, he found out about cycling um, and, and met the composer because he crashed into him and, f and realized that if you're a driver and you hit a cyclist, it's pretty much your fault as a driver, no matter what happened. So uh, it, it, things are weighted towards cyclists heavily there. And Ann, any parting words before you do our wrap up? This has just been a lot of fun having a group like this, and, and I just really enjoy increasing awareness about all this. I think it gives us all some food for thought, and I think we'll all be better drivers and cyclists for it. Well, uh, I'd like to thank our guests for appearing tonight. I've had a good thank time. You. I Thanks. mean, the time went Thanks. fast. I've, I've learned a few things. Uh, you go throughout every day learning, learning things, and I've, I've learned a great deal. Greg has invited me out to ride on some bike boulevards, and I'm going to take you up on it. Great. As soon as the weather gets a little warmer, we can do it now. you can count on me being out there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's go to Zoo Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some Zoo Bombers. <laughs> Wait till you see them. We're all in our 60s, and the thing we do, we go over a little humps. <laughs> and so uh, now, Ann, for the wrap up. Okay. Well, again, we'd like to thank our, our panel for joining us today. And we'd like to invite all of you to join us again live on December 18th for our one-hour Christmas special featuring several kids from the Boys and Girls Club from Portland and the Beaverton Pal Club. Well, I'd like for you to uh, remember to obey all traffic laws. Pay attention to your surroundings. Look out for one another. And please, please share the road. And we'll see you next time. Oh, great show.